In his 1911 book titled Principles of Scientific Management, mechanical engineer and management consultant Frederick Winslow Taylor lays out his plan as to how industrial efficiency can be obtained. It is worth noting that Taylor's book was published during the middle of the Progressive Era, a period in American history marked by its social activism and political reform. Taylor, who has been regarded as the father of scientific management, was an efficiency expert and his ideas were highly influential during the Progressive Era. In fact, in the introduction of his book, Taylor alludes to a speech made by President Theodore Roosevelt. In his speech, Taylor points out that Roosevelt laments about the wastes of human effort, as well as the lack of national efficiency. Taylor argues early on in his book that scientific management principles, if correctly applied, will help to increase national efficiency. In chapter one of his book, Taylor remarks that there is a common perception for people to believe that the relationships between employers and employees are typically antagonistic, with the employer wanting to get as much labor out of the employee, while the employee, on the other hand, tries to get by with doing as little as possible. According to Taylor, when employees deliberately plan to do as little as possible, this is an act that he refers to throughout his book as soldiering. Taylor writes that soldiering, or doing as little as possible by the employee, represents one of the greatest evils in America. In his book, Taylor lays down a detailed plan as to how managers can do away with soldiering, thereby increasing the efficiency and speed of their operation. He also argues that if soldiering were completely eliminated, this would lower the cost of production, which would make the United States more competitive in the global marketplace. Frederick Taylor makes it fairly clear that rule of thumb management practices are inferior to scientific management practices. Rule of thumb management, according to Taylor, is what most employers rely on. Taylor contends that if left unchecked, rule of thumb management practices will result in systematic soldiering where workers intentionally deprive their employer of an honest day's work. As a result, poor relations between employers and employees are likely to develop and wages may be poor as well. Taylor insists that one of the keys toward eliminating systematic soldiering involves management studying the job and essentially figuring out what constitutes a good day's work. If, on the other hand, an employer is ignorant of how fast a particular type of work can be done, then employees will soldier throughout their jobs while still convincing their employer that they are doing a good job. In this book, Taylor also argues that employers and managers must keep systematic records and study the smallest details of their trade. Under scientific management, the employers and managers must develop the one best way of how to accomplish a task. This will be achieved through a scientific study and analysis and gradually, if done correctly, Taylor argues that the mechanical arts will substitute the rule of thumb way of accomplishing a task. It is worth noting that Taylor believed that only those in management were capable of developing the one best way to accomplish a task. Taylor argued that menial workers simply did not have the intelligence or educational background to understand scientific laws. Therefore, it was the job of the manager to develop the one best way and then show his subordinate how to accomplish this task. Taylor believed that under scientific management, 
the relationship between employers and employees was intimate and personal. This is because management was responsible for teaching an employee to do the job. There would be daily intimate shoulder to shoulder contact with management and this would essentially remove all soldiering which would eventually increase the output. As we will soon see, Taylor believed in rewarding hard workers. He insisted that under scientific management there was a friendly cooperation between the management and the worker. In chapter 2 of his book, Taylor discusses the handling of pig iron and uses this as an example to show how management should develop the science behind a job and then teach the worker how to be more efficient. Taylor is very adamant that management is much is in a much better position to know the best way that a job should be accomplished. And Taylor gives an example of a workman that he refers to in his book as Schmidt to illustrate how management can co-opt employees into performing a job a certain way. Taylor maintains that managers can induce employees to follow their specific instructions by appealing to their economic interests. For example, Schmidt is told that he will receive high wages if he proves to be a high-priced man or a first-class workman. Taylor uses the example of Schmidt to illustrate that it is possible for the interests of the workmen and management to become the same as opposed to being antagonistic. It is worth noting that Taylor does acknowledge that every so often a worker may make a suggestion to management as to how a job can be done more efficiently. Taylor contends that when this happens, the management must first verify that the suggestion does in fact make a job more efficient. If this is indeed the case, Taylor writes that the employee should be rewarded for the suggestion. Still, having said this, Taylor would most likely argue that in the vast majority of cases, it is the upper management that would be the most responsible for making a job more efficient. Interestingly, Taylor acknowledges that not every worker is suited to every type of job. Therefore, in addition to using science in order to determine the most efficient way to complete a task, managers must also be able to use science in order to identify the type of person who is best capable of performing a specific type of job. This person will then be given the training. In his book, Taylor uses the example of inspecting bicycle balls in order to illustrate the scientific selection of the workman, or in this case, actually the workwoman, since his subjects were females. He argues that only certain types of workers were suited toward this task. Interestingly, Taylor also shows that these workers were given breaks as well as a shorter workday he found that this actually resulted in an increased efficiency. It is important to point out that Taylor recognizes that workers are motiva motivated by a permanent increase in their pay. And he writes that employers should be willing to give this to first class workmen. However, Taylor argues that it is unwise to overpay a worker. He argues that if a worker is paid too much, it is possible that the worker may become lazy and unreliable. For example, he may have an excess of money and may not see the necessity of getting up and going to work every day. Taylor also argues that scientific management is characterized by what he refers to as multiple foremanship. This essentially means that workers will have many different managers. There will, of course, be managers who teach workers the job. Then there will be managers who help to repair and maintain the equipment. There will also be a manager who answers questions about pay and time off. And there will be a manager who is specifically responsible for disciplining 
and giving instructions to the employees. This notion of multiple foremanship was fairly new when Taylor alluded to it and is different than the rule of thumb management practices that were being used during this time period. Taylor realizes that it may be difficult for an employee to implement scientific management practices and he even cautions that this should not be done overnight. Taylor suggests that it may take a few years for this conversion to fully take place. He contends that this should be done gradually and the workmen should be convinced that scientific management is superior to, tra to traditional rule of thumb management practices. Finally, Taylor argues that scientific management not only benefits workers and managers, he also asserts that scientific management benefits what he refers to as the great third party. This refers to the consumers who buy products and ultimately, in effect, pay the wages of both the workmen as well as the employer. Taylor argues that if scientific management practices are utilized, the great third party will benefit by having lower prices. So for example, if carefully selected workmen are taught the science of handling pig iron, then it stands to reason that the consumer will inevitably, will inevitably be able to buy this product for a cheaper price, given that it is being produced more efficiently. As a result, consumers will begin to demand efficiency, which will encourage employers to utilize scientific management practices.